Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the Faithful and for the Faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. How you doing? All right. Tonight, David, how about yourself? Pretty good. Pretty good. I'm yeah. happier than I was this time last night. Well, there's something about an Oilers win, isn't there? <laughs> it always makes, yeah. If you're a fan of the team, it always feels good. Yeah, yeah it just always the, does the feel level good. of performance was so much better tonight. I'm not actually sure about that, but it wasn't perfect. I, it but was, but it they was were playing better. with more tempo, and they they were actually passing the puck with a plum at times. I think there's the difference tonight was their skilled players got a few breaks and came, also came through, made a few more better plays. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it was in some ways kind of a similar game um, in a lot of ways. Um, maybe the other team wasn't quite as, uh, didn't get the goaltending that Montreal got. I think that was right. one big difference. And um, just the order skill players separated tonight. And we're going to yeah, get into that right. in our Two Good Things, Two Bad Things, and Two Numbers podcast. Bruce, what is your good thing yeah i'm going to go with the uh dazzling goal that opened the scoring in this game uh, evan bouchard a player who i would submit was desperately in need for something good to happen yeah uh, made something good happen uh, with a a wonderful rush it was uh Official scoring play was Bouchard from Dry Settle and Pod Coles and one point each. So obviously they each made it happen, right? But in reality, Pod Coles and Dry Settle made a couple of passes deep in Edmonton territory with Dry Settle making a fairly routine pass into the middle of the ice for Bouchard to take it. And he just went coast to coast with it. And I thought the end zone replay maybe showed it best that. The Ottawa defense just opened wide coming through the neutral zone. Bouchard saw this this wide gulf and he just took off and went straight up the middle. And then he came in on the Ottawa defenseman, Thomas Shabbat. So not exactly a third pairing defenseman. Shabbat tonight, he played 22 and a half minutes and that's, I think, pretty normal for that guy. But uh, uh, Bouchard was able to to uh, jam the puck right through him and step around him, come out the other side, uh, right in the low slot with the puck. And then just basically one motion, he scooped it right into the top corner, like just under the bar, just inside the post. Not a rocket, but just such a perfectly placed, almost a flip shot from from close range that uh, Linus Olmark had no chance. Very much a highlight real goal. You'll be seeing that in the and the uh, plays of the month, and pretty good chance you'll be seeing it on plays of the year, because uh, it really was that that high of a quality of play and and more spectacular than we're used to seeing from Evan Bouchard. Uh, he's more you know a volume shooter in general, and and you know obviously he gets his goals, but they're not usually of type dazzling, but this one really was. And after getting shut out last night, uh, to get on the board, to open the scoring, to get the lead, and to do so in, you know, in the fourth minute of the game was huge. And you could, as a fan, if they know just that play sort of lifted my spirits that, hey, yeah, they, you know, they've come to play and they're going to win this game that they badly need to win. Ottawa had uh, four of the first five grade-A shots in the game, Bruce, Mm -hmm. and looked sharper to me. And the the Mm -hmm. fifth grade-A shot was the goal that they tied it. So that goal by Bouchard really gave the Oilers a leg up. It gave them a little bit of time to get their heads together and get get going. They had to be sore and they had to be tired after (laughs) playing in Montreal the night before. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that that was just a fabulous skill play. By a yes. by a fantastically skilled player. Yes. I'm not in the camp of people at all that um, doesn't like Evan Bouchard as a player. And and what his critics will say is, well, they like his attacking and they hate his defending. And uh, that's that's fair, right? Like especially this year, he's been 
he's really regressed. He reached a very high level by the playoffs of last year's season, both in terms of attacking and defending him and Ekholm. Against tough competition, they both were playing very well, I think, at both ends of the ice. You know, there was mistakes by, by both of them because they're playing against such great players. But um, Bouchard has taken a step back. He has looked sleepy on defense. He looks sleepy on defense tonight, Bruce. If a few bounces have gone a different, a few different ways, mm-hmm. you know, he gave up a breakaway or two. Uh, when, where he went the wrong, he got deked out of his uh, jock strap by Amodio at, at center ice. Yeah. And Amodio went in and hit the post. You know, things have got a little different. The the torrent of abuse about, about Evan Bouchard, which has been really uh, at a high volume in recent days, would have been off the charts. So he didn't mm-hmm. score and had been scored on once or twice. But um, that's hockey. That, that's how it works. It's, a, it's not easy in the NHL. It's why they're paid a lot of money. Uh, to take the physical and uh, uh, mental <laughs> torment of being NHL players. It's, not, it's, it's I think it's a, le- a much less easy job than many people might imagine. Anyway, good for Evan Bouchard to come through like that. You know, I was, uh, you know, I, I like this kind of defenseman. I like mm-hmm. Justin Schultz, you know, who was mm-hmm. the, who was a lesser version of Evan Bouchard and uh, less good plays and maybe more bad plays. So, but I still like this kind of player, a defenseman who can really move the puck, really skate. And, you know, yeah, they, these guys do uh, make errors, but you need this kind of defenseman to win in hockey. And they're not easy to come by. They're not easy. If you trade Evan Bouchard or let him go, I think you spend a long time looking for him. And I know what people would say, well, you could plug in someone else, you know, Tony Tyson Berry or Tony D'Angelo or whoever else. Um Shane Gottisbeer, someone like that, on the Oilers' power play, and they'd get their sixty points, seventy points, and and you know they certainly get points. They they would get points. They'd get a lot of points. I think Bouchard's a pretty special player, and will prove it over the length of his NHL career. Um, he, I think, he is a Team Canada quality hockey player, and will prove that over the length of his career. So good to see him <laughs> redeem his reputation a little bit tonight. You mentioned Team Canada, and I've been wondering if. Uh... The uh, Four Nations Cup is hanging over a couple of these Oilers that are on the cusp of making Team Canada. And I, I'm looking at all three of, uh, of uh, Bouchard, Zach Hyman, and uh, Stu Skinner that were all sort of mentioned as being in the mix as possible players on the team. You know, none of them has really had their A game going for the, for the first quarter of this season. And you wonder if there's... Any involved, you know, any sort of extra right. pressure on them or whatever. What do you think? Because I mean, they all played really well at times in the playoffs when there had to be mm-hmm. more pressure. Sure. Yeah, I agree. So it's, it's a, a different, different kind thing. of pressure. None, these it's guys, different... none of them played best on best because the NHL hasn't had any of it yeah. for like 10 years. I, so. Bouchard is, is known as a like an outstanding athlete in everything he tries. That's the word on him on the team. I think when, when you ask players who's the best athlete on the orders, I think the orders all say Evan Bouchard. He just strikes me as someone who's unreal coordinated, just unbelievably coordinated and calm. He's a cal- very calm individual. And does that calm ever pay off at times when he has the puck? Even on this rush, he looked calm, Bruce. Yes. But it, the calm looks bad at other times. It looks when like indifference defending. when it goes wrong. Yeah, yeah, and I don't see it that I I never see it that way. I just think that's how he plays hockey. He's playing mm-hmm. at the same, that's, that's how he does it. And the key for him is decision making, making the right decisions, and so and he's much better at that on the attack, traditionally than on defense. So, but I I thought he really it, when it, when the chips were down last year in the playoffs, I thought he was a a solid defender. So I'm not I'm not worried about him um, as a def- defensive defenseman in the Stanley Cup playoffs. It's, and that's what it, that's what it's all about this year is is winning the Stanley Cup. Yeah. Well, he's had. Uh, uh... I mean, obviously, he plays with the best of the best, so his stats will always be, I think, a little bit inflated. But if you look at the NHL defenseman, I just brought it up now, uh, 76 of them that have played 300 minutes of five-on-five hockey this year. So mostly these are the big minute munchers. I didn't, I said a fairly high filter. Mm -hmm. Number one, uh, for shots on goal, um, Josh Hare, Matthias Ekholm, 
almost 65%. Second in the league, Evan Bouchard, 63%. Third in the league, Thomas Shabbat, the guy <laughs> Bouchard made look silly, 60, just over 60%. Uh, Quinn Hughes fourth at 60% and all the rest are, are below 60%. And there's some pretty good defensemen on this list a little further down, you know, uh, like the play is constantly going north with, uh, and what happened last night when Bouchard and Ekholm got outshot in Montreal and frankly had a real tough night, both of them, um, is very rare like it's often like i look at this sheet with the you know the shot shares and the players on the ice and tonight for instance it's uh uh 26 13 uh for echo and 24 13 for bouchard for shot attempts shots on goal 13 to 8 14 you know edmonton out shoots the other guys routinely three to two or better when uh, that top pairing is on the ice and they're just part of the unit, but they're a very important part of that unit. And that you know they are Edmonton's drivers from the back end, and uh, and Bush is so uh, it's clearly one of those guys. Bruce, my good thing is the top line tonight, and um, I'm not usually a fan of seeing seeing McDavid and Drysdale together. I thought it was a really good idea tonight. They yeah. did really well. They've done historically well against Ottawa, if I'm not mistaken, together. They ripped them apart in the COVID season. And um, I also thought it sends a message to players like Hyman, Nugent Hopkins, and others. You've got to earn it to play with McDavid and Drysaddle. Like, step up, crank it up, do it on your own mm -hmm. for a while. And I thought that was also really healthy um, as a message from the head coach. And... Um, Pod Colson's an interesting player to pair with him. He's a, um, uh, well, I'm going to say he's a glue player because he he's doing things that a lot of other forwards don't want to do. He's hitting, he's back checking, and he's passing the puck unselfishly constantly to his teammates. He doesn't need the puck. So he's an interesting player. Hasn't scored this year, but... Um, no goals, but man, he's he in terms of contributing to grade A shots, Bruce, he's right up there. Um, according to our, uh, let me just have a look here. I, I think I can call this up right away. This is just for night after 19 games. Um, he is fourth for right re for regular wingers. So Hyman's way ahead of any anyone else at like 2.6 per game. Major contributions at even strength mm -hmm. to grade A shots. Then Arvidsson at 1.9, although Arvidsson hadn't been scoring, he's doing okay. Then Pod Colson and RNH are tied at one, essentially 1 1.2 per game. So he's he's, he's not, tonight. yeah, and he's not, he, so he doesn't, I don't imagine a lot of those are shots, but he wins a lot of battles on the forecheck, pops pucks, gets them to the bigger, you know, the, the more skilled players, and he's doing his job. I really like how he plays. So he uh, got two assists tonight. Sure um, their goals were, you know, he he was instrumental in the first goal for that line. He takes a, a pass uh, from Bouchard and he just ha makes kind of a, a slap pass, I think, as much, you know, on net as much as anything. it's uh, He's not really shooting and McDavid gets the rebound. He's trying to pass it to McDavid and the goalie gets in the way initially, but the puck does go to McDavid who slams it in. Very, very Passed nice play. Passed off Omar's pads. Um, that's, a, that's a tactic that some players use. They deliberately try and, you know, this uh, shoot for the far side where the goalie's got no choice but to punt the rebound. And if he punts it onto a friendly stick, well, McDavid scored two goals like that on this road trip. Nice to see McDavid get easy ones because so often he gets hard ones. But, uh, you know, anytime he gets a uh, kind of a freebie goal, that's fantastic. He made a brilliant shot on the power play. Um, <laughs> there's what there, I think it's the end zone replay or, you know, from the Oilers oh. end where you see he had hardly a, the defenseman and came out to block that, that shot and, and he almost blocked it. He just had a fraction of a fraction of, mm -hmm. of a of a scintilla of a nothing to put that puck in and he managed to do it. And um, Allmark, it just had no chance on a brilliant shot like that. And, you know, he was, he's just taking his chances, getting the puck by the defenseman on that side and hoping it goes, you know, it's going to be inside the post rather than outside the post, but it was inside the post. What a fantastic goal. But I liked most of all, Bruce, go ahead. 
It was about the fifth replay, and they showed it like after, at the next stoppage, which was like with under one second left in the first period. But if it doesn't make the highlight reel, so for those diehard Oilers fans, and I know you're out there who record the games, uh, go past the goal and go to the, there's a whistle with like 0.5 of a second left in the first period. And at that whistle, they show this replay from behind the puck. And it's like almost a perfect angle. And you see when McDavid's letting it go and Zub is like almost perfectly positioned to block the shot. And behind Zub is Ulmar. <laughs> you can't see the goalie. And, you know, you know, if the goalie, if you can't see the goalie from the point of view of the puck, well, guess what the goalie sees? He can't see the puck either, right? And uh, he did not see that one, I'm sure, until it was in the net. And he did guess and stick his blocker out, but it was late because, you know, the puck got past. And, uh, and it was a sliver of a, of a, of a spot by, by Zub's leg. He shot it just outside of Zub and just inside the post. And it was a basically perfect shot. You know, both those goals by McDavid, like we, we've heard a lot about the Oilers getting a lot of shots on net and good shots on net, but mm -hmm. not getting any puck luck. And this is where you see puck luck in a way. Because Pud Colson's pass, shot pass, doesn't always go to McDavid with the wide open net. And it have, the, the Oilers have him get, getting a lot of pucks to mm -hmm. fall to them like that. And McDavid's shot, another night hits Zub's shin pad, right? Or, or hits the post and doesn't go in. Like... Puck luck is a huge, it, it's real, it's huge, and it impacts teams over long stretches of play. So um, the orders are get got a little bit of it back tonight. And then the 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 play that I love the most from McDavid, um, Henrik makes a great play at center ice, winning the puck and pushing it with a stick forward. McDavid comes in, and what a beautiful pass. Um, just such a great touch pass, leading dry sidle, it, it, you know, through it like around a defender, he kind of reaches around, leans forward a bit, and passes it around the defender forward. And dry settle charges in and gets it and scores. It was a brilliant pass by Connor McDavid, and and it was one of these nights where skill wins the game. You know, it, there's often sometimes comparisons between the 1980s Oilers and these Oilers. And um, the 1980, 80s Oilers were a more dominant team. They had more skill. So they won more games easily just on pure skill. But sometimes Edmonton's team, this team, takes over on pure skill. And it's usually three or four or five guys who are exhibiting it, and, just some, mm -hmm. and most often it's two. And um, that's what we saw tonight. Two guys, well, three guys, mm -hmm. Bouchard, Dreisettle, and McDavid, um, really took over this game. Um, with their skill. And I would say this, one other thing I, I thought about Bruce on that play is if we don't know if McDavid and Dreisel are going to be a thing this year in the playoffs, like it's, it's a little different. I'm not as against that alignment necessarily. Um, we'll see how the other lines develop because there should be scoring on these other lines with Arvidsson and Skinner, sure. Nugent Hopkins and Hyman. Like, but Henrik is an interesting player maybe mm -hmm. with these, like in a, in a, more high skill game. Henrik could, he's such a smart player and he's physical and he's good. Like he's makes plays and he's gritty. He might be an interesting player to, now that would be three centers though, that you're spending on one line, which would be the downside. So maybe you wouldn't do that because of that, but you never know. That was, that was an interesting combination as well. Henrik emerged from the penalty box. And of course, McDavid and Drysaddle were put out for their usual uh, you know, power couple thing after after Oilers kill a penalty or don't yeah. kill it for that matter, the next shift. And tonight they were playing together all the time, so it wasn't anything different. But Henrique being the third player on the line was different because he came out from the penalty box and joined the play. And Henrique, in 23 seconds between him getting on the ice and 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 them scoring, he set up two Two on ones with Drysaddle and uh, and McDavid. He made a check in the neutral zone, and sent Leon in. And Leon tried to feed Connor, and when he really, I thought he should have shot. And I'm giving a little feedback on that decision. And the puck goes back out and into the neutral zone, and Henrique is there in the lane. He intercepts the pass. Uh, he sort of stops up the puck. He takes a hit. He gets knocked down on the ice. He battles for the puck, and with his sort of shaft and stick on the ice, he just bumps it forward to McDavid, who then makes that feed to uh, 
to dry settle it. You described beautiful uh, artistic pass by McDavid, whereas Henrique's pass was a hundred percent grunt work. Uh, but you know, smart play by him, uh, and you know, excellent defensive play to you know break up an Ottawa rush and get the puck going north again. And that was that might have been Adam Henrique's best moment of the season to date. He's you know been struggling to to score. Um, but he just, you know, he made like several excellent plays in a row and he was rewarded with it on the score sheet. Bruce, what's your bad thing? Yeah, another injury, David, another injury. We don't know the details yet, but they always, I'm, uh, the injuries always worry me. This is Zach Hyman playing in a 600th NHL game tonight. Nice milestone for Zach, but kind of a crappy way for it to finish with him. Uh, not returning for the third period, uh, he took an absolutely wicked cross check. That guy takes a lot of punishment, and he does so most nights. Takes punishment. Last night, uh, Jacky clobbered him in the neutral zone after Hyman chipped the puck past him in the, presumably an interference situation that didn't get called. And tonight it was a different kind of play where the Oilers were busting over the line and the defenseman number three for Ottawa, who is Nick Jensen, he decided he was going to mess up the, the rush by putting Hyman offside. And he tried to put Hyman offside with a wicked cross check. And Hyman, you know, took the hit and he went down and he got up and he kind of stumbled around a little bit and finished the shift. But then they said he didn't come out for the third period. And uh, uh, we didn't see him again for the rest of the night. And the thinking was, well, the Oilers were ahead by three and it was the third and four nights and why overtax a guy? We, 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 you know, we, we've got a nice lead. We can finish this off. And hopefully it was just that precautionary. But the last thing they need is, a, you know, an injury to a big minute forward. And even as Hyman's production numbers are down, he's still among them. The most productive NHL forwards in terms of creating, or should I say, being involved in uh, high danger chances. He's in the top 10 in the league for in individual high danger chances, according to uh, natural statics measure. And he's just a volume. He creates it like he's not a brilliant finisher. He just creates so many chances and some of them go in. And this year, hardly any of them have been going in, but he's still been creating the chances. That's how what we're seeing too, Bruce, in terms of our uh, grade A scoring chances. He's he's playing at exactly the same level as last season, just not on the power play. <laughs> but not on the just not on the power play. Not and none of them are, right? Them are. They're all down a court on the power play. And, and that's... Um, my bad thing is the Oilers, they're just down a quarter of the power play. And you can see this in their uh, grade A shots numbers. Um, so this, even tonight, they, the Senators had 13 to the Oilers 10. Now, a lot of those came in garbage time for the Senators. Yeah. So um, there's that. But but overall, if we compare the Oilers this year in their 20 games under Knobloch to the 69 games under Knobloch, um, their scoring chance... Uh, differential last year was plus 4.6 per game. That's a really, that's a goal. That's more than a goal a game um, that you're, yeah. That, yeah, that you're expecting. It's like, what right. is that? 1.3 goals per game or something um, better than the opposition that in, its, in terms of expected goals. This year, um, they're down to just 3.2 plus 3.2 their differential so far this year, which is actually pretty good. It's like it's 0.75 goals per game. Mm -hmm. And um, so you'd expect um, them to be, have a bit better record than, than they have. Um, their their uh, grade A shots against totals are almost exactly the same this year and last year, 11.6 last year, 11.7 this year. The difference is on the attack Last year, they were at 16.2 per game. This year, they're at 14.9. And, I'll, I'll, and I didn't break out the power play numbers. I should have done that. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess most of this difference is on the power play, that they're down probably about one or one to two power play grade A shots per game this year. And that's the major difference. So they're not that far off in some ways. Their goaltending hasn't been that good. And their puck luck has been atrocious, but their power play is is 
something that they've relied that you know obviously they really have relied on it for the last five years it's been outstanding and, and this year um not so much oh is it trending up now a bit though i mean they got it they did get the one tonight but well yeah they got they got one tonight on a five on three they got a real yeah. gift yeah a five on three after you know after a sense penalty got called and then the veteran claude Giroux got called for a face-off violation when it was deemed that he had, he got knocked to the ice in the battle for the puck, and he, I think he was trying to hook it back with the with the shaft of his stick between his gloves, but he touched it with one of his gloves, and that's a no-no, and it's a penalty. It's not just a, you know, and so he went to the box two seconds into the first penalty, and now it's a five-on-three for a minute and fifty-eight seconds. Wow, and that's a long, long time. Five on three, and that was the one where McDavid made that beautiful shot that that uh, put that one to bed. But the, the orders, you know, this year their their shot rates on the power play are way down. Now this is traditional traditional shots, and they're down below forty two shots per sixty. And, what were they last year? Do you know? And, and I'm just going to get last year because that was that was. Uh, they were up over 60, I think, last year. Like, it's a huge difference. Uh, they certainly were two years ago. At, uh, uh, yeah, last year they were at 62, and this year they're below 42. Like, it's they're down by a third power play shots per 60 minutes on the power play or per whatever. You know, their rates are, are slashed. So... Uh, and their high, you know, their expected goals last year was over 10, and this year it's down around seven or seven and a half. So it's not just that they're shooting in bad luck, it's they're shooting less. They're creating fewer shots and, and fewer great chances. And, and, the, and the outcome is that, you know, they got four totals. I mean, Evan Bouchard tonight, that was his third power play point of the season, 20 games three power play points last year he had 37 in the regular season and 14 more in the playoffs power play points this year he's got three like he's way way off it's it not just not. him i mean he's setting up the same kind of plays they're just not finishing them hyman shots and deflections aren't going in and dry saddles one timers are either getting thwarted before the puck gets to him or he's hitting the side of the net or you know, whatever. It's just they're a half bubble off plum, and they have been from the get go. So last year, Bruce, in the playoffs, um, in tw uh, 25 playoff games, they had 90 grade A shots on the power play in total. Mm -hmm. 25 games, 90 grade A shots. This year, 20 games, 45 grade A shots on the power play so far. So. <laughs> Yeah, and that's in the playoffs against supposedly right. good penalty kills, like elite penalty kills, although L.A. and Vancouver weren't that good, uh, fortunately. But, um, n yeah, 90 to 45, there's a five-game yeah. difference there. But nope. nonetheless, yeah, that's a we don't massive know the drop. numbers of penalties. Usually there's fewer in the yeah, playoffs. Yeah, that, so. that's true. That that could be the case, too. Well, yeah. There hasn't been a ton of power no, plays so far not, this year. There's been a few games with one power play. Yeah. All right, Bruce, we've already been talking about a lot of numbers. Let's do some more. What is your number tonight? No, yeah, I'm going to go with 931, which is Stu Skinner's save percentage. And I think Stu, Stu Skinner deserves huge kudos for his play in this game. I thought he was really good. Uh, there was a lot of breakdowns in front of him. And he kept putting out fires to stop breakaways and, uh, you know, pileups around the net and, and uh you know, keeping them down to one, down to one. I'm thinking he needs a, you know, a, a one goal against game within a resounding win. And of course, that didn't happen because he's had such trouble and such, frankly, bad luck at times finishing games where the other guys score late, even in a decided game. Remember Vancouver scored a real late one that had him kind of unhappy. That made it seven yeah. to three. And I was worried that, uh, you know, Ottawa made it 5-2 on, to me, clearly a legal high stick. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's no way that guy's stick was below the crossbar, but 
the refs didn't see it, and then they didn't see enough on the replay to overrule themselves. And I guess they wanted to throw a bone to the home fans that were still hanging in there, five to two. And then I thought, well, the very last thing I want to see now is a third goal and yet another sort of three goal against mediocre looking night for Skinner who played so well. And to his credit, he he made a fantastic save on a on a cross ice pass slammed on net and he got across and was able to keep that one out with about a minute to play to keep it at five two. And that you know, two goals or less, that's a really good game for a goalie in uh, NHL, sort of as a general rule. And it was good to see him keep it at that level with, you know, 20, 27 stops out of 29. And, and just, I thought, a pretty much rock-solid game of goaltending. He looked co- confident. Louis DeBrus talked about the economy of movement that he shows when he's playing well. And uh, I think uh, that he was correct that that's what we saw tonight. And... Uh, uh, with a good save percentage, which has been a big problem for much of the season, uh, to uh, end the night with. So uh, uh, that's potentially big, but just deserves to be commended just for its impact on tonight's game. This could have been a real hairy finish kind of game if uh, they hadn't received as sound a net minding as they did. He did play well, and 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 again. A relief if you're an Oilers fan. Big time. And uh, you cheer for Stu Skinner, which 90% of Oilers fans do. Maybe 80%. All right. Did they win? (laughs) (laughs) We all have that aspect, I think. Uh, I'm just looking at the NHL's top 10 scores, and my number is seventh overall. Leon Dreisaitl with his three-point night has gone to 27th, tied for 7th, 27 points in 20 games. He is um, seven points back of Nate McKinnon, who's got 34 points in 19 games. So good for Leon. And Connor McDavid, after his slow start, he's now um, tied for 12th with Artemi Panarin. He's got 24 points in 17 games now. So they're shooting up the scoring charts with a bullet, which is always good to see, which is always good to see. The the name that surprises me, Bruce, in the top 10 list, because usually by now it starts to, the, like the pretenders have dropped out, the guys who aren't going to get right. a point a game, the, for instance, this year. And everyone yeah, in the top 10 looks for right. real. But Dylan Strom has got, he's fifth, and he's got 28 points in 18 games. And it just made me, like, I remember watching Strom in... Uh, with eerie. eerie and not thinking of, like hoping that the orders weren't going to get him because I didn't think he I didn't think he didn't have he just looked too slow honestly um to be a big time NHL scorer for me and it's taken him a while but he's slowly been creeping up he got 65 points um 2 years ago 67 last year and now 28 in 18 games and Bruce, I just, what year was it that, how old was Phil Esposito when he broke through as a big scorer? Because, because Strom is one of these big hulking there. guys. He was on the second team, hey, after yeah. Chicago. Yeah. Chicago foolishly traded him to Boston. Turned out to be and the case. Didn't he went it? from playing on Bobby Hull's line to playing on Bobby Orr's power play, and it worked out all right for uh, Espo. What a great hockey player, Phil yeah, Esposito. He was. I'll always have a super soft spot in my heart for Phil Esposito because of the 1972 Canada Cup. Um, just looking at it, his first big year was in Boston. He had 84 points in 74 games. And at that point, he was 25. So he was younger than Strong. So anyway. They, they, 68, that was. So, was it, yeah. What was it? No, six, six, 67. 67, 68. 67, so it's 68. Expansion yeah. year. Right. The so, trade was the year after or broke in. And then expansion summer, there was that huge trade with Esposito, Hodge, and Stanfield all going to Boston. And they uh, they lit it up there. They won that trade sure very did. handily. Yeah. That's so, yeah, sure. Espo, he's a pretty good comp for dry title, I think. Yeah, they're well, similar. More kind more of scoring titles, but the, the, there's... Uh, uh, you mentioned Leon being in seventh right now, which is your number. 
Yeah, and he is uh, in the last uh, how many years now? This this is where he's finished in NHL scoring, and since 2018-19, fourth, first, second, fourth, second, and then last year way way down in seventh. His worst season in the last uh, six years was seventh in the league after five in a row in the top four. So, and it's nice to see him back up there and, and rising the chart. And, and he's not just, you know, he's not just piling them in on the power play. This year he's doing much, much better at even strength and frankly worse on the power play. So, but he's, uh, uh, you know, he's climbing the charts because he, He's playing consistently well. We'll throw out last night's game for both the big guys and basically the whole team. Yeah. It was not a productive game for anyone. But um, otherwise, the two of them have had multi-point games. They each had four in a row. Then there was the shutout. And then they each had, you know, three-point game tonight. So, yeah. On the rise, things are unfolding as they should. All right. They play uh, Thursday against the Wild. Is that it? The Wild are in Edmonton on Thursday, and the Rangers are in Edmonton on Saturday. I'm going to that game. Oh, two and tough games, eh? Two tough games and not a lot of rest, David. Eastern road trip, three and four days back to back, and come home one day off, bang, Minnesota. One day off, bang, New York. And then they get a five-day break next week. So. Now, the Wild are uh, quite a hot team right now so uh we'll see what happens yeah, that there. kirill kaprizov is a real handful <laughs> he sure is yeah all right bruce dylan strom one final thing he's been playing yeah. with ovechkin yes and they've really hit it off together it's ovechkin's best line mate since um oats well not uh, oats but uh no uh, back what is it backstrom, backstrom. nicholas backstrom thank yeah. you uh, and and they've really been piling it in. And uh, Ovi, he actually is a league leader in goals. He's got 15. He's 39 years old. And he set a new record, well, new new mark, let's call it mark, for the oldest guy to score 15 goals before anyone else at age 39. The prior mark was held by Frank Mahovlich, who was first to 15 goals back in 1971-72 when he was 33 years old. Oh, he's like six years older than the previous guy to accomplish this feat. Uh, and, you know, it's just a, a milestone along the way. But, uh, you know, it's not like the first guy to three or five. I mean, 15 is substantial number of goals. Like we're getting to the point where, the, as you say, the, the stars are separating and there's old, 39-year-old Alex Ovechkin still pounding him in, or he was until he got hurt last night, and now we'll see what happens. He's got a leg injury week to week. I don't know why I said Oates. He he was long gone Colin from Oates. Washington by the, <laughs> by the time that um, Ovi got there, but Oates is, of course, a player who was a great setup man for Hull. Um, Hull and Oates, yeah. Hull and Oates and uh, other players as well. Hull from Oates, that should have said. <laughs> Yeah, just three years, though, together in St. Louis. Yeah, and then Hall had over 70 goals, all three of them. Yeah. All right, Bruce, let's leave it there. Thanks for talking tonight. All right, thanks for your listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.